a bowling alley in Las Cruces, a yogurt shop in Austin, a Lane Bryant clothing store in Illinois. All three are unsolved cases of multiple murders committed by one or more gunmen. These are all cases I'm sure you know well, but have you ever heard of the Below shooting massacre? At closing time, a man hiding inside of a Below grocery store reveals himself to the store's manager just after the doors are locked. The perpetrator brandishes a 45 caliber handgun and orders the store manager and a cashier to empty the store's money into a plastic bag. He leads the employees to the back of the store, gathering up members of a cleaning crew along the way. When all is said and done, three victims will lie dead of gunshot wounds. A fourth victim survives being shot and manages to call 911. A fifth victim is violently stabbed and left in critical condition, while one employee is left unharmed. The killer exits the store and vanishes into the night. For nearly 30 years, investigators have sought the identity of the killer, but to no avail. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 98, The Below Shooting Massacre. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we'll examine the Below Shooting Massacre. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at traceevpod, on Instagram at traceevidencepodcast, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. As a final note, Trace Evidence is a complete one-man operation, so if you'd like to help support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash traceevidence, where you can gain rewards such as stickers, pins, and other surprises. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to pitch in, there is a PayPal donation button on the website. Today, we examine a horrible crime that, while well-publicized in its own state, has received little attention nationally. This is Episode 98, The Below Shooting Massacre. Birdie County sits in the northeast corner of North Carolina, wedged between Hertford and Martin counties. Birdie is one of the smaller counties in the state, at least in terms of population, with census data showing less than 20,000 residents. For comparison's sake, nearby Halifax County has just over 50,000. Indeed, Birdie County is known as being a small and quiet area not often talked about beyond its own boundaries. The town of Windsor, located in the south, is the county seat, and as of its most recent census shows a total population of less than 3,000. Perhaps that's what makes this crime all the more horrifying, that even a small town beyond the purview of its own state can become ground zero for a terribly shocking incident that would ultimately bring both the town of Windsor and Bertie County into the headlines. And yet, it's one of those crimes that while violent and terrible, is so often overlooked and so infrequently discussed. Sunday, June 6, 1993 was the typical Sunday for the town of Windsor. Stores closed early in the evening, traffic dried up, and for the most part, people remained home with their families. It was a still and calm night, with the temperatures rising as summer approached. However, Everything typical about Windsor would change that night, and the Windsor Police Department would find themselves responding to a crime that simply didn't happen in their town. Sure, Windsor had its share of small-time crimes, but usually nothing that would require the full force to be in action, nor could they ever have imagined the horrors they would discover after responding to a panicked 911 call. The Bilo Supermarket, not to be confused with Bilo, sat on South Greenville Street. Typically, the Sunday closing crew for the store would be small as most residents had completed their grocery shopping earlier in the week or perhaps earlier in the day. 
The last few hours of work were always slow, with the random customer coming in here and there to grab one or two items as they needed, but the store was often quiet and vacant by 5 p.m., with the final hour being more about cleaning up and preparing for the next day, as opposed to ringing up carts full of groceries. On this particular night, however, Bilo was prepping for a floor cleaning. This required a small crew of four individuals to arrive at the store, where they would strip down the floors and apply a new coat of wax to give the tiles a high polish and gleam. According to the Roanoke News Herald, 47-year-old Grover Lee Cecil, known to many as Bud, was the closing manager that evening. Set to close at 6 p.m., only one other employee, 36-year-old Joyce Coburn Reason, a mother who worked as a cashier, remained on site with Bud. For the last 15 minutes of the store's operating hours, Bud had walked the store as most managers do, to notify any customers they may have had that the store would be closing soon and they should bring their items to the cashier. At the same time, a four-person cleaning crew had arrived and were bringing in equipment to prep for their work on the floor that night. At approximately 6 p.m., as the final customers walked out of the store, Bud approached the main entrance and, producing the keys from his pocket, began his normal nighttime procedure for locking up. As far as Bud was aware, the store was now empty but for himself, Joyce, and the four-person cleaning crew. However, at some point after locking the doors as Bud moved back into the store, he was approached by a man who had apparently hidden somewhere in the store waiting for those doors to be locked. At first, Bud believed this man to have simply been a customer who hadn't gotten out before the doors could be locked, but it quickly became apparent that this was not a paying customer. The man was imposing, later described as a black male sporting a short, military-style haircut with a slender build and medium complexion. The unknown assailant stood between 6 feet and 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighed approximately 175 to 200 pounds. It's unknown what words were exchanged between Bud and the suspect. However, what is known is that at some point, rather quickly after the two saw one another, the suspect produced a 45 caliber handgun and ordered Bud and then cashier Joyce to the front of the store where he demanded that they hand over all cash and money order receipts from the day's sales. All told, it's been said that the suspect obtained approximately $3,000 in his robbery. However, while robbery may have been a force behind the man's actions that evening, he wasn't yet done with the employees. In fact, he seemed to have come prepared to do more than just execute a robbery, as after being handed all of the money, the man then ordered Bud and Joyce to walk in front of him towards the back of the store. Jasper Hardy Jr., who was working on the cleaning crew that night, along with his brother Thomas, later recounted to the Rocky Mount Telegram how, shortly after 6 p.m., as he was prepping to clean, he looked up and noticed the approach of Bud and Joyce with what he would later describe as strange expressions on their faces. Hardy quickly noticed that there was a third person, a large black male he hadn't seen before, walking behind the two familiar faces. According to Hardy, Bud then told him to do as the man wanted, saying, quote, he means business, end quote. It was at this time that Hardy noticed the suspect was holding a gun, the barrel sitting just inches from Bud's back. Hardy quietly agreed, and the suspect led all three further into the rear of the store, grabbing up two more of the cleaning crew along the way. As they approached the meat counter, the gunman had the employees stand silently in front of him. Strangely, the man seemed familiar with both the store's layout and the crew, at one point noting that there was another cleaning crew member yet unaccounted for. Hardy recalls the gunman asking for the location of that crew member, which to some suggests that he may have been watching the crew arrive that night, while others believe the suspect may have had some connection to either the store or the cleaning crew itself. According to Hardy, the gunman didn't appear to be nervous, describing him as being at ease. He seemed to have either had experience with this type of crime or maybe had practiced it enough that he had a calm demeanor and knew what he wanted to do. In fact, as he proceeded through the store, he'd made sure to head down the aisle with pet supplies, at which time he grabbed a few dog leashes from the shelves. Back at the meat counter, the gunman ordered them to follow his demands. He then produced a roll of duct tape along with the dog leashes 
and planned to bind all six employees. At gunpoint, one employee and then another was ordered to bind each person. Hardy recalls his co-worker, 47-year-old Johnny Rankins, following the gunman's orders and wrapping duct tape around his ankles and wrists. When asked whether or not anyone said anything or argued with the assailant, Hardy couldn't recall any words being exchanged, saying, quote, I was too scared to notice. I've never been that scared in my life. End quote. While the exact timing can't be accounted for, at least not through the research materials I've utilized, at some point between the robbery and the binding, the gunman informed the employees that he was a former police officer who had been fired from his job and had nothing to lose. According to witnesses, the gunman had said that he had been fired from his job after a drug deal had gone bad. Reportedly, the gunman never appeared to get thrown off throughout the entire incident. He never raised his voice. He never even showed a hint of anger. The employees were all bound individually, not together, but then were forced into stacks of two. The gunman had one employee lie on top of another until there were three stacks of two employees apiece. As they lie on the ground, the employees assume that the horror of that night was nearing its end. The gunman had obtained the money he sought, no one had fought back, and now that they were bound and wouldn't be able to notify police in a timely manner, they figured that he would be done. Unfortunately, the gunman had other plans. Looking down on the leashed and taped employees, the gunman allegedly said something to the effect of, I hope God will forgive me for what I'm about to do. At this point, the suspect produced his 45 caliber handgun and opened fire. The gunman fired a single shot into the person on top of each stack. After the first three shots, he had mortally wounded Bud, Joyce, and cleaning crew member Johnny Rankins. Bud and Joyce were both shot in the head while Johnny Rankins was hit in the back. Another member of the cleaning crew, Sylvester Welch, known to friends as Tony, was injured during the shooting when a bullet penetrated him. Apparently, when the gunman went to fire his fourth shot, his gun either jammed or he was out of bullets. While the blood began pooling around the victims, the gunman seemed frustrated with his weapon, and so he proceeded to break the stacks apart, rolling all six victims onto their stomachs in a line before him, before he walked out of the room. In the quiet calm that followed the horror, the six victims lie on the ground, with three bleeding out and a fourth wounded but not critically. As they lie on the floor, only two victims at the time remained unharmed, brothers Jasper Hardy Jr. and the fourth cleaning crew member, Thomas Hardy. After what felt like an eternity, the gunman returned to the room, this time brandishing a large butcher knife he had apparently retrieved from elsewhere in the store. By the time he walked back into the room, several of the victims had stopped moving while others were squirming face down in the expanding pool of blood. With the knife in his hand, the assailant approached Thomas Hardy, one of the uninjured victims, and asked him if he was going to tell police who had committed the crime. Thomas said no, but the assailant said he didn't believe him, and he began stabbing him in the back and throat. Official reports state that the suspect stabbed Hardy so violently, he broke the knife blade off in his back. Now, with his gun jammed and his knife broken, the assailant turned his attention to the final uninjured victim, Jasper Hardy Jr. It was at this point that Hardy Jr. apparently told the gunman that he didn't get a good look at him and he wouldn't be able to identify him to police, at which time the killer allegedly replied, quote, I'm going to let you live, big man. You'll be a hero. End quote. After the horrifying attacks, the gunman walked over to the plastic bag he'd made Bud and Joyce fill with money, after picking up the bag, the suspect also took with him the remnants of the knife and the keys to the store before he quietly turned and exited, leaving the store without another word. Lying there in the blood, only cleaning crew member Welch was able to move around enough to try and seek out help. According to a later interview with Welch's wife, he stated that he'd been able to loosen up his bindings due to the blood weakening the adhesive. The others who were still alive were bound too tightly or too injured to be able to do anything. Welch managed over what can only be described as an agonizingly long and painful trek to drag himself, inch by inch, out of the back of the store. 
Over a period of time that's never been fully documented, Welch clawed and kicked and fought his way to the front of the store, leaving a thick trail of blood behind. When he reached the front of the store, Welch was able to get his hands on the phone, dialing 911. I'm now going to play you a clip from that 911 call and some of the radio chatter from the Windsor Police Department afterwards. By the time police arrived on the scene, it was already too late for Bud, Joyce, and Johnny. In that last audio clip, you can hear the officer say the three inside are DOA, or dead on arrival. Welch lie at the front of the store, wounded and bleeding, while Thomas Hardy remained in the back, bleeding extensively from his stab wounds. Only Jasper Hardy Jr. lie unharmed physically, though psychologically the damage had been done. Hardy Jr. could later recall feeling the impact as the man on top of him had been shot. Ferdy County Sheriff Wallace Perry would later say of Hardy Jr., quote, He was lucky. He was on the bottom. He felt the trauma when the man on top of him was shot, end quote. While the nightmare they'd had to endure was over in the moment, it would reverberate for the rest of their lives. Officers from the Windsor Police Department were absolutely horrified by the scene, never imagining something like that could happen in their little town. Bertie County Sheriff John Holly, who was related to one of the victims, would later tell News 12, quote, It was very gruesome, had a blood trail from the back all the way up to the front. Things like that, you know, you never forget. It's the worst thing I've seen in approximately 31 years. It was really bad. Even the guys that I talk with that have retired, it's on their minds, just like it was yesterday. End quote. Indeed, it was a horrifying scene with blood everywhere. While police worked at the scene, emergency medical technicians arrived to rush the victims to a nearby hospital, but it was already too late for some. Ultimately, Bud, Joyce, and Johnny lost their lives. Welch and Thomas Hardy were both taken to Pitt Memorial Hospital in Greenville, where they lingered in critical condition before beginning to recover. Welch would survive the attack, though 12 years later, in 2005, he would lose his life after a battle with cancer. Thomas Hardy, while severely wounded by the stabs, would also survive the attack, and Jasper Hardy Jr. was the only individual who had not been wounded at all. Then Windsor Police Chief Rodney Hoggard, when asked about what he had seen, replied, quote, I remember the smell of blood. There was blood everywhere. End quote. The crime scene was worked hard by investigators who walked the entire store gathering evidence of blood and bullet shells. Some trace evidence was recovered and police examined the store shelves looking for out-of-place items or places where the killer may have left prints behind. Indeed, fingerprints were recovered and have been processed through law enforcement systems multiple times, though no hits have ever been made. I've also read that DNA was recovered at the scene. Shoe prints were also found in some of the blood, as well as there being bloody shoe prints found throughout the store. One set of those shoe prints was later ruled out, having belonged to an EMS worker, though one set of those prints has never been identified. Police Chief Freddie Bowen would later tell reporters, quote, It looked like a robbery. At this time, there's just nothing to work with. End quote. While initially police defined the crime as a robbery gone wrong, the idea that this man had brought the duct tape with him and also grabbed the dog leashes led many to wonder if the robbery itself was peripheral to the murders, with the murders themselves being the ultimate goal. Once they obtained the information about the killer claiming to have been a former police officer, 
An all points bulletin was issued bearing that information, and within hours, the Windsor Police Department had received lists of recently fired or retired police officers from more than 20 different departments around the country. That number would only grow over time. This information combined with the assailant's military-style haircut led many to wonder if they truly were dealing with an ex-cop or perhaps someone ex-military or both. Of course, not everyone believed the killer's story. State Bureau of Investigation Special Agent Dwight Ransome would later tell the Roanoke News Herald, quote, I don't think either scenario fits this man. It has always puzzled me that he only had one magazine for his pistol. A person trained in the military or as a police officer always carries more than one magazine. That leads me to believe he wasn't military or a police officer. All I do know is he is a cold-blooded killer. End quote. Sheriff Perry had similar thoughts, noting that most police officers use 9mm handguns or in the past, 357 caliber handguns, not typically 45s. Sheriff Perry would go on to say, quote, It's an unusual gun for a police officer to be carrying. It leaves a nasty hole. End quote. Regardless of this belief, it was all data that had to be sorted through. Local police began in their own area working to rule out former Windsor police officers and Bertie County Sheriff's deputies. For the first four months of the investigation, the case was worked with the idea that the assailant was a former police officer, though as time went on, considering his mention of a drug deal gone bad, it was also considered the gunman may have been involved in the drug trade in Windsor. Sheriff Perry fielded many questions about the possible identity of the killer. Did he have a connection to the town or to the store itself? Though for the most part it was believed that the killer had likely been someone passing through or who knew the area but did not live in it. Sheriff Perry would go on to tell the Asheville Citizen Times, quote, He is a dangerous man. I don't feel it was aimed at anybody. He could do it again. This ranks among the worst I've seen in my 25 years in law enforcement. End quote. Outside of those who had been in the store, there were no direct witnesses to the crime. However, when police canvassed the area, they did come upon several witness accounts about a vehicle which had been seen in the proximity of the below parking lot in the moments leading up to and apparently during the murders themselves. Multiple witnesses reported seeing a white car with Maryland license plates speeding out of town, taking U.S. Route 17 North, heading away from the scene of the crime just moments after the murders had taken place. According to many of these witnesses, two men were seen in the vehicle, leading authorities to believe that this had been a two-man job, with the gunman entering the store while the other man remained in the car, keeping the engine running while also acting as a lookout. At the time, Maryland authorities were notified to be on the lookout. It should be noted, Maryland is approximately 250 miles to the north of Windsor. The response from the town was a combination of horror, shock, and fear. It had long been believed that Windsor simply wasn't the kind of town where these things happened, and many residents struggled to confront the possibility that the killer could be someone who had lived amongst them for a time, or maybe still did. In the immediate aftermath, Sheriff Perry told reporters that they had seen an uptick in applications for a concealed carry permit from local residents looking to protect themselves. It became clear very rapidly that Windsor had been shaken by the crime, and sadly, over 26 years later, the haunting incident remains a dark memory that neither residents nor local police would be soon to forget. If there even had been a possibility of forgetting, just three months later, the state of North Carolina would receive a horrifying reminder. On Monday, September 20th, 1993, just over three months after the murders at the Below grocery store, two more murders would happen at a different grocery store. Just over 100 miles to the west, in Raleigh, two employees of a local Food Lion grocery chain were shot and killed after closing. Due to the fact that both employees succumbed to their wounds, there was no ability to retrieve any eyewitness accounts. However, it has been reported that both victims had been guided into the rear left of the store, at which time they were shot with a low-caliber weapon. 
It's believed that the killers were present in the store for more than 30 to 45 minutes, and investigators did specify the likelihood of more than one perpetrator. 27-year-old John Ray and 20-year-old Michael Truelove had apparently been ambushed either at or just after closing time. John Ray's wife, who had arrived to pick him up that night, notified police that something was wrong when he failed to come out, and she found the store locked. When police gained entry, they made the horrifying discovery and, at the time, began considering the possibility that the double murder may have been connected to the June Below murders. When asked about this possibility, Raleigh Police Sergeant M.J. McAlam replied, quote, We're looking at it, but right now, there's not a lot of similarities. End quote. Eventually, through their hard investigative work, authorities managed to track down the two men responsible for the Food Lion shootings. 26-year-old Elmer Ray McNeil Jr. was arrested, tried, and convicted of the murders of John Ray and Michael Truelove. In 1996, McNeil Jr. was given the death penalty, though in 2009 that ruling was overturned due to issues with the trial itself. In the end, the district attorney acquiesced and accepted a life sentence for McNeil Jr. McNeil Jr. had apparently carried out the crime along with his brother, Robert Anthony McNeil, who had worked at the store and planned the crime while it was McNeil Jr. who had pulled the trigger, shooting both Ray and True Love execution style. Robert Anthony McNeil was also sentenced to life for his role in the crime. While the Food Lion murders were solved and life sentences were handed out to those responsible, it was quite clear that neither of these men had been responsible for the Belo murders as both were white males and the prime suspect in the Belo massacre was African American. In fact, in the nearly 30 years since the Belo massacre took place, the gunman has never been seen again. Authorities have gone to great lengths to try and suss him out, but this has been to no avail. It's an investigation which remains open, as well as being close to the hearts and minds of police working in Windsor and Bertie County. According to investigators, there is one name they have heard multiple times that could possibly be connected to the crimes. His face, they believe, resembles the first composite sketch that was made, mostly in terms of his hairline, but ultimately, he does not resemble the updated sketch and he had a solid alibi for his whereabouts during the crime. The name of this individual has never been publicly released as his status has never been elevated to anything beyond person of interest. He has never been a full-on suspect. In the years since the crime, investigators have come to several conclusions about the killer himself. Firstly, it's believed that the killer had been in that particular store before and had likely cased the location in preparation for the crime. They note that he was aware of the presence of knives in the back employee area, as well as believing that he had entered the store before closing and entered a pre-selected hiding spot which kept him hidden from security mirrors in the store. Beyond this, they do not believe this was the first violent crime committed by the killer. The fact that he stacked the bodies and knew that the 45 caliber shots would likely penetrate, hitting both people, suggests experience with that weapon. Also, it's just generally considered highly unlikely in the minds of law enforcement that a first-time killer would attempt this crime against six individuals at once. It's now believed that the murders were his primary motivation, with the robbery being secondary. In dealing with such a horrible crime, you'd imagine there'd be a lot of different theories, but in reality, they all tend to fall under the two same categories. The first theory argues that the crime was committed at random, that the killer had chosen this store for reasons unknown, cased it, planned the crime, and executed it with little or no connection to the store, the town of Windsor, or any of the victims. Under this theory, the killer would have fled the area, never returning. The second theory would purport that the killer selected this location not based around the store itself, but perhaps based around someone who was certain to be in the store that night. There are those who believe that this was too brutal and violent to have just been random, and that the killer may have targeted someone in that group. With this theory, there are those who believe that the killer may have lived in Windsor at some point and may possibly still be living in Windsor. Nearly 30 years have passed since that horrible June night 
and despite the existence of fingerprints, shoe prints, and even DNA, the suspect has eluded authorities. For the police who worked the case, and those who have since come into it, it's a frustrating and disturbing crime they seek to solve. For the families of the victims, it's a never-ending nightmare, moving on with their lives now absent of their loved ones, taken too soon by the whim of a violent killer. In total, a $30,000 reward remains active today for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the man responsible for this series of murders. The FBI did get involved at one point in time, lending the assistance of a profiler. According to that profile, it's believed that the killer has likely told someone about this crime in the years since. It was added that they believe the killer had likely told a woman, with Sheriff Perry adding, quote, She's probably living with him, and she's in danger. End quote. The fact of the matter remains clear. Someone likely knows more about this crime than they've ever shared. Someone out there knows this man and his accomplice. Someone out there may possess information that could help bring justice to those who were victimized by this horrible crime. It's now a race against time, as technology advances to re-examine evidence before the clock runs out and this brutal killer gets to live out his days without ever having to pay for what he has done. 26 years is long enough, and it's time for him to face justice. I first learned about the Below shooting massacre a few months ago. I've lived in North Carolina for over a decade now, and I'm pretty tapped into true crime, and yet I'd never heard of this case. When I began researching, I thought, I must have been missing something. So I reached out to fellow podcast hosts and asked if they knew anything about this case, but it was news to them as well. Frankly, that kind of blows my mind considering the nature of the crime. How is it possible that so few people have heard about this? Even doing the research was more challenging than usual, as finding articles about the case wasn't easy, and the articles I did find, for the most part, had a lot of repeated information in them. In a small town, on a quiet Sunday night, a gunman walked into a grocery store, robbed it, and then bound and shot multiple victims. He killed three with his first shots, he wounded another, and then brutally stabbed a fifth. Only the sixth person, Jasper Hardy Jr., walked away without a physical injury, though his brother was not as lucky. It's a terribly difficult crime to examine, and I can't possibly fathom the pain and anguish endured by those who died, those who survived, and the families of those who were lost. For more than 26 years now, this killer's been able to walk free of the consequences, and we can only hope that will change sooner or later. When it comes down to the two theories in this case, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to examine them independently. They're essentially two sides of the same coin, so rather than hitting one theory and then the other, I'm going to look at both theories side by side and address each angle as we progress through them. I mean, let's face it, we're dealing with the same suspect in both theories, the same circumstances of the crimes, and the only differences between the theories 1 and theory 2 has to do with motive and location more than the crime itself. I think motive is as good a place to start as any. For many, it's a debate. Was this a robbery gone wrong, or was this a planned murder spree with the money being just a bonus on top of the crime itself? Basically, since the first day I started working on this case, I've operated under the assumption that the main motive was murder. If you want to rob a grocery store and hope to walk away with a decent amount of money, it's unlikely you're going to select a quiet town in a remote location on a Sunday night. It just doesn't make any sense. There's plenty of larger chain grocery stores in bigger towns on busier nights that could have been targeted if this was all about money. Even if you adjust for inflation, the $3,000 taken on that night in 1993 only rises up to $5,300 today. Is that really an amount of money worth murdering three people while attempting to actually murder five? That just seems patently ridiculous to consider it as a motive. But then again, we have to remember, people are killed for far less money than that every day. I've read plenty of cases where someone was murdered for as little as $50. But this case does seem a little different. 
This wasn't just a guy walking into a grocery store and hoping they'd have a bunch of money lying around. If indeed investigators are correct, and this guy committed the time and attention to visit the store, possibly on more than one occasion, casing it, finding the best angles, noticing knives in the back room area, and selecting a hiding location, then this is far beyond a mere smash-and-grab kind of robbery. And take a moment to just think about the process. This guy walked the store. He may have interacted with one or two employees on different days. He watched where they went, how they moved, what areas they visited, which ones were visited frequently, and which ones were ignored more often. He noted the location of the dog leashes. He found a hiding spot and took the time to figure out whether or not he could be noticed in that spot during the nighttime closing procedures. He stood in that store. He walked those aisles, knowing full well that in a matter of time, he was going to come back in, climbing to his hiding space, and wait to execute everyone he found working that night. I don't know how often this store had its floors cleaned. I know in my experience in retail, we didn't have our floors waxed every weekend. It was kind of rare, actually, with us really only having to get the floors waxed every couple of months. Now, obviously, that could be different here, though I do think it's a bit much to imagine a small grocery store would be spending the money to have their floors waxed every weekend. Regardless of the schedule, we know this guy paid attention and kept track of things. He knew how many people were on the cleaning crew that night, so much so that he noticed when there was one person missing while he was gathering everybody at the meat counter. I've seen the killer described as cold, calculating, and meticulous. For the most part, I'd agree with that assessment. We also know there's a high likelihood that this guy had an accomplice outside in the car just keeping an eye out and being ready to hit the gas when the shooter jumped into the passenger seat. So now we're looking at two people who believe that a little grocery store was worth robbing as well as the fact that if they murdered people in the process, that was acceptable. It's hard to know what the relationship may have been between killer and accomplice, but it's difficult to imagine that the accomplice didn't know about the murders ahead of time, and if he didn't, he'd likely have heard the gunshots once it all began. Do you think that murder was the plan all along? I don't see much here to contradict that. If you want to rob a store and you don't want to be identified, wear a mask. The guy had already snuck into the store and found a hiding space. It's not like he couldn't have brought a mask with him to conceal his identity, but he seemed unconcerned about that. In fact, he seemed completely unfazed by the fact that he was having people tied up all the while he knew he was going to be shooting them. It doesn't get much colder than that. Most retail employees are trained to just go along with a robber's actions because it's the easiest way to get out of there and to avoid being victimized. Sadly, in this case, this man seemed to want victims much more than he wanted the money. So assuming murder may have been the primary motivator, you've got to ask, why this particular location? Look, I live in North Carolina, and prior to researching this case, I'd never even heard of the town of Windsor. I doubt there's a ton of people passing through that town on a daily basis, nor do I imagine that a lot of people who aren't locals find themselves shopping at the b -Low grocery store. This seems to suggest that the killer either stumbled upon this store somewhere in his travels and decided it would be a good place to hit, or he knew that store, and he knew it was there because he lived in the area or nearby, or he had simply been to that store before. I can see why a lot of people would think the killer had to be a local, or at least at some point may have been a local. It just doesn't seem like the kind of place you'd come across randomly and choose to target, though on the other side of that coin, What's a better place to target than one no one would ever expect you to target? There are some major roads that run through Windsor, namely US 17 and 13, so it's not out of the question that the killer could have driven through at different times and stopped in at the below, as it was located along a major roadway. Maybe it was as simple as being seen as an easy option. You could swing into the parking lot, commit the crime, and then be screeching wheels out of town before anyone was the wiser. Remember, Witnesses did report a white car with Marilyn plates speeding up US-17 moments after the crime. But if it was just a matter of a random location, why go through all the prep of casing the store as extensively as it was done? If robbery were the motive, if this were random, 
You'd imagine the guy would have just walked in with a gun out right at closing, had the manager locked the doors, and then gone ahead with this plan. But there was obviously a lot more going on here. This guy went into that store to plan his crime. He hid in the store knowing full well that this wasn't just a robbery. This man had blood on his mind, he had violence in his heart, and before long he pulled off the terrible crime without even a hint of hesitance. It's not an easy thing to shoot someone. It's definitely not an easy thing to shoot multiple people who are tied up, and it's a different thing entirely to use a knife and stab someone so brutally. It seems clear this wasn't someone who was squeamish in the slightest, nor did the idea of taking life seem to disturb him at all. In fact, it seemed to be exactly what he was hoping to do, and so the question becomes why? Was this just someone who wanted to attack and commit some random murders? Or was this someone who was targeting someone specific in that store, and everyone else just happened to be collateral damage? From everything I've been able to gather, I haven't seen anything to suggest a link between the killer and the victims. There's nothing in their backgrounds which would connect them. There weren't a bunch of people coming forward to say that any of these people had major issues with anyone or that anyone was out to get them. Sure, there could be something that was missed, but again, you're not talking about a major city crime area here. You're talking about a small town. These are people with strong ties to the community. Surely, if someone had been targeted for something, or they thought they were in some kind of danger, someone would have known. But maybe not. Maybe something was missed. After the crimes, the one man who was not injured, Jasper Hardy Jr., was questioned pretty fiercely by investigators. They found it difficult to believe that the killer was so ruthless and brutal with everyone, but decided to let this guy live. And when you really look at it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. He specifically asked Thomas Hardy if he was going to identify him to police and then stabbed him even after he said he wouldn't. So why did he allow Jasper to pass through the incident unscathed? On the one hand, you could argue, as some did, that he may have known Jasper. On the other, this may have just been one of those instances in which a psychopath wielding a gun and a knife took pleasure out of being able to control who lived and who died and that allowing Jasper to live was just another power play to feed his ego. Ultimately, after several series of questionings, police came to the conclusion that neither Jasper nor any of the other victims had a connection to the killer. So, was this really a matter of a killer who just wanted to kill, and didn't particularly care who his victims were? As unsettling as that may be, that might be exactly what happened here. And that may have contributed to why this guy has gone unidentified for so many years. If he truly had no connection, if he truly had no primary target, it's a lot more difficult to try and track him down when you don't even have a square one to work off of in terms of identity. One interesting angle of this case is the potential connection to drugs. We know the killer claimed to have been a police officer who lost his job over a drug deal gone bad. It's hard to know exactly what that means without context, but it sounds like he may have been a cop who was involved in illegal activities and one of those activities would tied to drugs. In subsequent interviews, multiple members of law enforcement stated that Windsor had a drug problem at the time, so it began being considered that, rather than being an ex-cop, this man may have been someone tied to the local drug trade who had major issues with the cops and wanted to throw some shade at them. Perhaps he delivered drugs to the area, or had connections to dealers in the area, or was one himself. Unfortunately, that remains unknown. However, maybe drugs could work to explain the theft in the first place. It isn't uncommon for someone hooked on drugs to rob a place, even knowing there isn't a ton of money available, simply because they want to get their hands on some drugs, and they don't care how they go about doing it. I find it fascinating that the killer was described as being calm and collected. It's always made me wonder if he was on something at the time of the crime, obviously not an upper, but maybe something that kept him so cool and reserved. Again, we just have no way of knowing. So what have we really got here? A cold-blooded killer walks into a grocery store knowing he's going to kill. He takes $3,000 and then murders three people, severely injuring two others and leaving the sixth untouched. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and trying to get to the bottom of what happened here is almost impossible. I can't begin to imagine the frustration that investigators must live with trying to figure out who could have done such a horrible thing in their quiet little town. 
I can't begin to imagine how hard it must be for those who survived and the families of those who didn't to not know who did this or why their loved ones were taken from them. Police have looked at this case from all angles, and while there are those who believe the killer was local and may in fact still be living in the Windsor area, that's generally considered unlikely. Given the amount of attention this case got in the area, it's hard to imagine that someone local wouldn't have already turned this guy in or at least given his name to investigators. There was that one person of interest who was supposedly named by multiple people as a possibility. But when the guy has a solid alibi and they can't tie him to the crime, it's difficult to investigate it much further. Also, we know law enforcement's in possession of fingerprints and possibly even DNA, though the nature of that DNA evidence I can't be sure of, so you'd think they'd have compared this to this potential suspect. As anonymously as this guy strode into the Below store, he seems to have just as quickly vanished back into that anonymity. Really, the last angle of the theories to look at is whether or not this was an ex-cop or ex-military. Judging from the haircut, I can definitely see why it was described as a military cut. It was shaved up super short on the sides and back with a little length left on top. I'll provide the composite sketch on the website for those of you who wish to take a look for yourselves. Then, there's the planning. This isn't a guy who just walked in off the street, but someone who planned things out meticulously and left little to chance. His gun jamming seems to have been the only hiccup he encountered in the execution of his plan, and it certainly didn't slow him down. But that does raise some interesting questions. I agree with law enforcement that if this was a former cop or someone who was ex-military, there's no way he'd plan this out as well as he did without bringing along another magazine or more ammunition. It just doesn't make sense. And the only thing that could possibly explain that away is that he couldn't get his hands on another magazine or ammunition, which just doesn't seem realistic. Either that or he had another magazine and more ammunition, but the gun was jammed in such a way that he knew he couldn't utilize it and he didn't want to spend the time to clear the jam. He was obviously cool under pressure, and the idea of killing people didn't bother him, but that could speak more towards the possibility of a psychopathic mindset rather than any kind of military or law enforcement training. If he was an ex-cop, you'd think they'd have tracked him down by now. If he was ex-military, it may have been a little more challenging, but you'd imagine that there would be fingerprints on record for both members of the military and members of the police force, and yet the prints found at the scene have never matched anyone. It's impossible, like so much in this case, to know anything for sure. He could have been exactly what he said he was, or he could have just been telling a story. The story in general seems to have been designed specifically for those in the store, not for the police who would be investigating it. I mean, if the guy was planning to kill almost everyone in there, then it really doesn't matter what he told them in terms of whether he was a cop or ex-military or anything else. Maybe he said he was former law enforcement to make them feel more calm, believing he was robbing them but not intending to kill them. As insane as that sounds, the idea that an ex-cop is robbing you, you may think, well, he's going to take the money, but he's going to let us live. Maybe. He just liked to make up stories and didn't have any basis for what details he delivered other than whatever mood he happened to be in that day. The Below shooting massacre is a terrible crime perpetrated by someone who clearly has no regard for human life and, if nothing else, seemed to take joy in terrorizing others. For 26 years, this man has evaded police and managed to live out whatever life he chooses to while those who were victimized by his acts have been left scarred or without their lives. At this particular time, his identity remains as mysterious as it was that Sunday night in June of 1993. However, with advancements in technology and evidence to work with, the hope remains that his identity will be discovered. Until there can be a breakthrough with the evidence, someone comes forward or the killer himself reveals his identity. This case remains open unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the Below shooting massacre, there are some news articles and websites that discuss this case. All sources for this episode will, as always, be available on the website at trace-evidence.com. If you have any information about the Below shooting massacre, 
please contact the Windsor Police Department at area code 252-794-3111 or the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation at 1-800-334-3000. A $30,000 reward still remains for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the Below Shooting Massacre killer. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, Instagram message me at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. This year, CrimeCon will be held in Orlando, Florida. And for the second year running, I will be present on Podcast Row representing Trace Evidence. I'm really looking forward to meeting a lot of you. So, if you're planning to go to CrimeCon and you haven't yet purchased a pass, you can use promo code TRACE2020 to receive 10% off a standard badge. That's T-R-A-C-E-2020 to save 10% off a standard badge today. I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. Now it's time to thank our amazing Patreon producers. I've updated the list this month. If you think your name should be here and you don't hear it, please contact me. Patreon is notoriously bad for the way that it organized the lists of patrons, so I may have missed someone. I'll be happy to correct that. But for this month's Patreon producers, a special thank you goes to Tara Doble, Alicia Lorraine, Angie Dodd, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Gerard Lopez Barbosa, Julia Rexon, Kate Alexander, Kelly Cohen, Laura Dickinson, Lisa Holly, Linda Halcrow, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Randy Wyland, Robbie Blue, Chandra Moreau, Samantha Ford, Tom Archer, and Wannabe Sleuth 2. You're all fantastically amazing, and I am deeply indebted to your graciousness. One last note before the end of the show. There's a good chance that come January, I'm going to be looking to hire a researcher. The podcast is finally in a position where I could be able to bring on an employee and I would love to hire somebody who has experience doing research, who loves true crime and who is detail oriented as I am. So in the coming weeks, probably in episode 100, but more than likely in episodes before that, I'll provide some kind of information on how you can apply for that position or send me a resume or something along those lines. But if it's something that you might be interested in, take some time, think about it and the opportunity will be coming. I want to thank you all for listening. You have no idea how much it means to me and anyone out there listening right now, you might be the key to solving one of these cases. So that's going to do it for this week's episode. And I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence. Trace Evidence.